The following is a production of the University of Minnesota, driven to discover. Hi, this is David Arendale, your host for the Peer Assisted Learning Groups podcast. Thanks for spending some time with me today. In this podcast episode, we feature brief overviews of publications about leader identity emergence by the study group leaders. Except for the first two, all the rest are by researchers from around the globe. This begins a series of podcast episodes where we examine entries from the annotated bibliography of peer learning programs. There's now nearly 1,700 in the database. Throughout the season and next, we'll be sharing topical bibliographies. I use the word we since I will provide the introduction and short commentary about each. The narration of the publication overview will be by a member of my Synthetic Voice family. I hope that the interactions that occurs will make the listening more enjoyable. Due to the length of this particular bibliography, it will be spread over two episodes. In addition to the audio episode, I also provide a PDF copy of the complete topical bibliography. You won't actually hear every single entry that's inside of the larger document. Be sure to download it. Many of them are available online. You can also see all of the other topical bibliographies along with the master copy on my website. A shortcut web link is https slash slash z dot umn dot edu slash peerbib. Well, first up is Ronald telling you about one of my recent publications on this topic. Well, tell us about it. Arendale published a book chapter in 2021 named Incubators for Student Leader Identity Emergence. The book's name is Student Support Services, Exploring Impact on Student Engagement, Experience, and Learning. Arendale said that too often student services has become a provider of discrete assistance in which one-way information transactions take place between the staff student paraprofessionals providers and the students receiving the services. Students attend academic advising appointments, listen during tutorial or small group study meetings, and read computer screens of information during career exploration sessions. Transactions seldom lead to transformations of engagement, identity, and deep learning for the students who provide or receive the service. Student leaders involved in student services, students as partners partnerships, student organizations, and athletics experience unanticipated personal and professional growth. Case studies from Australia, Belgium, Indonesia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States display global connections among common themes of co-curricular learning events from such rich environments. This chapter provides a conceptual model for an ecosystem of leader identity emergence that can be effective in a variety of student activity venues and recommendations to be more intentional in fostering growth. Well, David, since this is your book chapter, you must have a number of thoughts about it. Tell us more. Well, thanks, Ronald. This was a really challenging book chapter to work on since the publisher asked me to not just share about a learning identity model for student study group leaders. They wanted something that looked much broader. They wanted something that looked at, well, what happens to leaders who are orientation leaders or are athletes or are officers and student organizations and many others? So it was really a learning experience for me. I had to find a common theme among all of these different places, and it really came through for me. Let me just give you an example of one, and that was in terms of athletics. How was it that athletics serves to foster leader identity among many people on the team and not just simply the team captain? Well, whenever I started looking at the broader literature, there was something that was called network leader identity. And that was, who are the leaders in the group that aren't formally recognized for being the leader? They may not have any title, but they are absolutely vital for the organization to be successful. And I thought about that in terms of athletics when I thought about the sports teams that I was on. Whenever I thought about football, there wasn't just simply the team captains. There wasn't just simply the head of the defense or the quarterback, there was lots of role players who made a big difference, and they were just as vital in some ways as the uh, people who were recognized as the official leaders then. Well, it's time now to turn over to Leslie 
because she has another article that I published this year. Thanks, David. Arendale, Hain, and Fredrickson wrote an article in 2021 named Leader Identity Emergence of Study Group Facilitators. It will be published in a future edition of the Journal of Peer Learning and will be available online at that time. The researchers conducted this qualitative study at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and investigated leader identity emergence of study group facilitators. There is a gap in the professional literature regarding study group programs and identity emergence of the student paraprofessionals who facilitate the study sessions. This study built upon previous studies of identity formation by integrating educational theories that help explain the changes that occurred. Peer study group programs are a powerful co-curricular experience. This study provided answers of why and how identity emergence occurred. The leader identity development model for peer study group facilitators was developed based on the findings from this study and other experiences with study group leaders over the past three decades by David Arendale to help predict this change in experiences that supported identity formation. Among those catalysts were written reflections by the study group leaders throughout the academic term about what they learned about themselves and their conversations with other study leaders and the study group program manager. Implications are provided that explain how peer programs can become a more transformative learning ecosystem. Peer learning programs present an untapped personal and professional development program for student leaders that would be even more powerful if it was intentional rather than serendipitous. David, what was one of the most surprising things that you discovered during this research project? What was amazing to us was how powerful this learning program was for helping to foster leader identity emergence amongst the leaders whenever that was never one of our objectives, nor one of the activities which we helped to foster. If only would we have been more intentional about this, what kinds of changes could have occurred amongst the leaders? And I guess that's the reason why I think it's important to share the lesson and to learn what other programs are doing. Well, next up is Noah, and he's going to share an article from some researchers in Australia. Best, Hadzler, Ivanov, and Lemon published an article in 2008 named Peer Mentoring as a Strategy to Improve Paramedic Students' Clinical Skills. It appeared in the Australasian Journal of Peer Learning and is available online. The authors documented the rationale and outcomes of a peer mentoring program based on supplemental instruction in which selected third-year paramedic students took on the role of mentors within a second-year clinical practice subject. Participating students reported an improvement with their clinical skills. At Victoria University in Australia the SI program has been customized and renamed Peer Assisted Study Sessions. This approach was designed to improve students' clinical skills and judgment and to improve their confidence and use of clinical equipment. The past mentors reported gains in assistance with projects, revitalized interest in work, and increased self-confidence. Mentees reported increases in their learning and development, increased personal support, and an increase in confidence. The program also provided students with a leadership role to extend their own competency with the content material. Anything that you want to add, David? Well, as Noah pointed out, the students developed not only their vocational skills, they also improved their confidence levels. That's going to be a reoccurring theme with many of the articles inside of this topical bibliography. Sometime, I hope to write an article, along with some other colleagues, about how programs increase the confidence level of both the leaders as well as the participants and how that carries over in their studies and their confidence about a future occupation and other elements of their life. Well, next up is Olivia, and she's telling us about peer-led team learning, a fast-growing program across the country that is commonly used with challenging courses in chemistry and Chase, Rao, Lakmala, and Varma Nelson published an article in 2020 named Beyond Content Knowledge. Transferable skills connected to experience as a peer leader in a PLTL program and long-term impacts. It appeared in the International Journal of STEM Education and is available online. The authors explained that being a successful peer-led team learning workshop leader involves developing content knowledge and workshop facilitation skills. These skills are helpful to being a peer leader, however, do not terminate at the end of one's undergraduate program. In fact, many former peer leaders denote having been a peer leader on their LinkedIn profile. This study examines the transferable skills that former peer leaders identified as being valuable in their current positions. 
we conducted semi-structured interviews with former peer leaders from varying disciplines, universities, ages, and years since being a peer leader. Interview questions captured leadership experiences including successes and challenges of being peer leaders, roles and responsibilities, and specific transferable skills further developed by being peer leaders, and how they are being utilized in the leader's current position. Thematic analyses of these interviews indicate that former peer leaders recognize leadership skills, coping with many challenges including not having the right answer, collaboration teamwork skills, self-confidence, and problem-solving skills as being relevant and frequently used in their current work. David, what did you think about how some students were listing their leader roles and the skills they learned on their LinkedIn accounts? Well, I think it showed the ingenuity of the students understanding how important their role was and using things like LinkedIn in order to be able to list and demonstrate the skills that are required because of that experience. It reminds me that we as peer managers also need to take a little bit of time sometime during the academic term to help our students understand how to be able to describe this, place it onto their resumes or CVs, be able to identify the specific skills which they have acquired, which are transferable and could be used in other places. An yeah, excellent article. Well, up next is John, and he's got a report from the United Kingdom that builds on this benefit of developing essential job skills. Chilvers and Wagholm published an article in 2018 named Exploring Past Leadership Beyond Graduation. It appeared in the Journal of Peer Learning and is available online. The authors explained how developing university graduates' employability is of increasing strategic institutional focus in the United Kingdom. Existing research evidence is the role of peer-assisted study sessions in supporting students to develop personal, professional and employability skills. This research explores the impact of the past leader role on graduates' job application experiences, their employability and effectiveness in their current roles. Past leader graduate survey and interview findings demonstrated participants referred to their past leader role significantly on their resumes, application forms and in job interviews. Respondents said that past leadership, aided by reflection, enabled them to clearly evidence their development of employability skills, which they perceived as enabling them to stand out from other job candidates. Interview participants explained their past leadership informed their development of a range of employability skills and attributes, including communication, confidence, teamwork, facilitation and leadership. Past leadership was regarded as addressing gaps in their course curriculum for developing skills they perceived as important for their current roles, highlighting the value of go and extracurricular programs, such as PASS. David, have you read other research studies that focused on employability skills and where were they published? Well, that's a good question. Most of the time, these publications that are focused on the development of employability skills, they come out of Australia and the United Kingdom, and some other places that are outside the United States. I could only venture a guess that it may be that accountability is more rigorous in other countries than it is here in the United States. Those who are in the United States might argue with me about that, but read the literature about what institutions have to do in order to be able to report back to the national government in order to be able to have stable funding for the following year. Well, coming up next is Amber, and she's going to talk about a early graduate thesis that examined the consequences for being a study group leader. Davis completed her thesis for a Master of Science degree in 1999. The name of the thesis was Student Mentors, Experiences of Being a Supplemental Instruction Leader. Davis examined the experience of serving as a supplemental instruction leader upon the individual at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. A qualitative research study was conducted of SI leaders during fall 1997. Some common benefits cited were improved communication skills, problem-solving skills, subject matter knowledge, people skills, friendships, knowledge of campus layout and resources, time management skills, involvement and knowledge of campus activities, leadership skills, and feelings of connection to the campus. Some mentioned that SI opened doors to new experiences that drew them closer to their desired career goal. David, do you have a comment about this study and its importance? 
The two things that I heard from this report was the development of friendships and the feelings of connection with the campus. Well, you see that in our lots of literature that's out and how important that is in order for people to be able to make that connection, feel engaged, have a sense of belonging. What I want to draw your attention to, however, is this study came out in 1999, over two decades ago. So Davis really does set an excellent example, and I highly recommend that you obtain her thesis through a interlibrary loan in order to see more about these two factors, which we talk about all the time in terms of helping students be able to persist, is through the development of friendships and through a sense of belonging with the campus community. Well, next up is Libby, and she's going to talk to us about an article and a research study from the United Kingdom. In 1998, Dunlan and Kay published an article named Supplemental Instruction, Students Helping Students Learning at University College London and University of Central Lancashire. It was published in the International Journal of Legal Education. The Supplemental Instruction Programme is used to meet the needs of first-year students in their academic and personal development within the law faculties of the University College London and the University of Central Lancashire. The United Kingdom expansion of the SI model develops more holistically in cognitive and effective aspects of learning for both SI participants and SI leaders. The three law courses that had SI attached to them were English Legal System, Obligations 1, and Lawyer Skills. There are several variations of SI within the United Kingdom use of the model. SI leaders are instructed to focus on facilitating the group discussion and not presenting course content material and SI leaders academic credit for their service through evaluation of a portfolio. Higher grades were recorded for SI participants and SI leaders when compared with non-participants. Interviews with SI participants revealed the following SI program benefits, enhanced academic understanding, enjoyed active learning, opportunity to clarify concepts, enjoyed the social aspects of meeting students of other classes, and developed personal confidence and reassurance. Benefits cited by the SI leaders included opportunity to help others, developed communication, presentation, and leadership skills, increased knowledge of the academic content of the course. David, do you know more about the variations of SI as it is offered in the United Kingdom? Well, I do know a little bit more about the British SI, or as they would call it, PASS or PAL or other names, from personal experience, whenever I was working back at the International Center for SI, I had an opportunity to talk with a number of the staff and faculty members who did the training workshops, did the publications. I met Donalyn and I met a number of other colleagues, was over there a couple of times. Things are more structured inside of Great Britain with their higher education system versus the United States. They have an additional layer of academic support for students, and they're called professional tutors. These are full-time people. They're professional staff. They have jobs that can continue throughout their entire academic career. So in a sense, they serve as a resource between the students and the faculty members. And the goal for these professional tutors is to prepare students for the lecturers. Whenever SI was introduced, there was some concern that this might be an inexpensive way to provide similar support and to eliminate these professional staff members. There's a long story about that. If you look in the articles about the history of SI, you'll be able to have a longer explanation. But what happened was in Great Britain, the SI or PAL or PASS program was designed to prepare you for the lecturer who prepares you for the class lectures themselves. One element in order to make sure there's not a duplication between the professional tutors and the SI leaders was that the SI leaders could never ever answer a question from students. 
They were totally to focus on the process for learning, turning the questions back to the students and their lecture notes and their textbooks. But it was very much more structured, but also it was very strongly embraced. So it's just simply a unique feature of Great Britain and I think some other countries as well. Well, next up is Guy, and he's going to share with us about a dissertation study on the experiences of peer leaders and how that had an impact on developing a wide variety of outcomes, including how they saw themselves as leaders. Dreyfus completed a doctoral dissertation in 2012. The topic was exploring the phenomenon of leading through the experiences of peer leaders. Dreyfus says that the concept of leadership has been explored in many contexts, yet it is not a role that is expected as part of a college education. Peer leaders are in a unique position because they are responsible for leading a group of students to learn. This phenomenological case study explored the experience of leading by peer leaders, college students who are selected and trained in adult learning theory to lead a group of students to learn the course material in an introductory science course in a peer-led team learning program at an urban commuter public college. 17 of the 22 study participants served more than one semester, averaging four, over the past 10 years. In-depth interviews were conducted and three emergent metaphors were identified. These are the older sibling, a role based in prior learning of family with informal authority, the faces of the mountain, a more traditional view of leadership combining positional authority and entity attributes, and the catalyst, manager of several small groups of learners, giving power back to the group members. The essence of leading by peer leaders is proposed as the following, leading a workshop group is drawn from prior experience, perhaps a familial role of a sibling, or tacit assumptions and expectations of the role of a leader. It has a cognitive foundation in the task of helping students learn course material yet it is in the dynamics of interacting with the students that a relational process occurs. Emergent relational leadership roles are based in communication, discourse, emotions, diversity of learners' needs and abilities. It is through this experiential process that leading becomes a catalytic activity whereby the leader manages smaller groups to enable each group member to help others learn. Relational leadership is inclusive, challenging, and carries with it the burden of responsibilities to fellow students, fellow peer leaders, faculty, and the department. It can also be fun and may flow with energy, and most importantly, it can be transformational in the ways the peer leader views being a follower, learning, and leadership. David, what was an important concept you learned from this dissertation? The thing that stuck out for me the most from this dissertation among the many, many things that are inside of it was the metaphor of the family and how you could identify different roles that the leaders took in their work, and he was using that in terms of a descriptor of family roles, sister, brother, father. And I just thought about that and how that really deserves a lot more attention and consideration in future work. You know, one of the great things about any dissertation, that includes the one that I completed way back in the year 2000, was what had previous dissertation research been? And replication of previous studies to see whether they were valid with your particular population at your institution. Well, anyway, that's what I was thinking about. Well, Carol's now going to share another article by Dreyfus and his research colleagues. Dreyfus and Freeman published an article in 2015. It was named Peer-Led Team Learning an active learning method for the 21st century. It appeared in the conference proceedings for the 8th International Conference of Education, Research and Innovation in Spain. The authors explained how peer-led team learning is a strategy to further education reform and improvement. It increases retention in courses in the sciences, mathematics and engineering, as well as in other disciplines, improves the learning process and prepares students to work in teams, and creates outstanding student leaders. The program engages an experienced and trained student as the overseer of a small group of learners in the capacity of Vygotsky's more capable peer. 
This program has been recognized as a strategy to help students emulate the peer leaders as role models, to reduce student anxiety and build confidence in the learners. It builds strong study skills, develops such critical workplace skills as working in teams, listening, critical thinking, leadership development, and fosters communities of learners who approach learning as a way of life. The peer leaders, generally undergraduate students who are trained for this role, understand the challenges that students have with the material. In a new initiative peer leaders are creating and developing workshop material in conjunction with faculty, augmenting their metacognition. This approach has been internationally recognized as a curriculum enhancement strategy adopted at over 150 universities and colleges across the United States, and in the United Kingdom and Jamaica, West Indies. The six critical components which distinguish the mode include integration of the workshop component into the course structure, involvement of the teaching faculty, training and supervision of the peer leaders, creation of challenging materials, and provision of appropriate institutional resources. In addition, published data over the past 20 years have shown that using successful peer leaders in small group workshops boost performance in critical first-year courses including core math, science and engineering courses. David, why did you want to highlight this program? The reason is that I think there's some real valuable lessons to learn from peer-led team learning, their particular approach to offering academic support with peer leaders. It's interesting how they have a much more structured approach. I'm not claiming that it's a better approach, but I think it's always wise to look and see what are all the different models that are out there. That's that's what I try to do with the annotated bibliography with featuring seven nationally or internationally disseminated programs. And inside of this particular document, they talk about the six critical components. And I just think that it's a wise thing to check out what other programs are doing, their intentionality, how they approach development of leadership skills, as well as leadership identity. Well, next up is James. And he's telling us about a study in England of developing employability skills through the experience of study leaders. Ford, Thackeray, Barnes, and Hendricks wrote an article in 2015 named Peer Learning Leaders, Developing Employability Through Facilitating the Learning of Others. It was published in the Journal of Learning Development in Higher Education. The authors described how employability is a key theme in higher education and attitudes towards its development have shifted from a focus on technical skills development to a broader focus on values, intellect, social engagement and performance, contributing to graduate identity. Peer-assisted learning and language conversation clubs are both examples of student-led peer learning schemes at Bournemouth University in the United Kingdom and are reviewed to explore the development of students employed to lead and facilitate group learning sessions. Data from four annual evaluation surveys is reviewed in addition to qualitative comments and reflective writing. Peer leaders were found to have developed employability attributes including leadership, time management and organization, communication, and cultural awareness. Above all, peer leaders identified with developing confidence in their roles. Comments provided examples of student leaders who had actively selected peer learning as an opportunity to develop their confidence and were able to transfer this to other academic and employment contexts. David, do you know more about the British Study Group program? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I've had the privilege to meet many of the leaders inside of the SI PAL PASS community inside of England, had a chance to travel over there for a couple of conferences, and also actually be on the campus of Bournemouth. You know, one of the things that I really was struck by this article is this reoccurring theme of not only employability skills, but also the benefit of gaining confidence and of that confidence spilling over into all elements of the student's life, whether it be personal confidence in themselves, you know, people who were shy and didn't think that they had the ability to lead a group, speak in front of others. Then you have inside the article talking about confidence in terms of future vocations, 
you know, it's an uncertain future. You may be doing all of your academic preparation work, but what's really going to happen whenever you go to the job site? So once again, as I mentioned in an earlier comment, I think that a study just focused on the development of confidence would be a really good one for the field and understanding more of what it is that's happening to not only to the students who are developing confidence, but also the leaders themselves. Well, up next is Natasha, and she's going to give us an overview of an article from Australia that tells us how they've adapted the SI approach to their cultural and educational context. Gardner published an article named Supplemental Instruction, a cost-effective, student-centered collaborative learning program in the 1996 conference proceedings of the second international open learning conference that occurred in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. This paper presented by Emeritus Professor Ron Gardner of Queensland University of Technology describes the use of supplemental instruction in Australia. After an extensive description of the SI model, program benefits for the SI leaders, and the course instructors are described. Benefits to the SI leaders include deeper understanding of the course content, development of leadership and group facilitation skills, increased self-confidence, improved job marketability, and admission to advanced graduate work due to service as SI leader, development of professional relationship with course professor, membership in an effective peer support network, and modest financial reward, Benefits for the course professors that have SI attached to their lectures. Timely feedback concerning the comprehension level of the students regarding course material. Opportunity to repeat previous lecture material in a modified fashion to increase comprehension. An option to modify future teaching strategies based on feedback from students. A basis for accessing additional funds through grants, example. Teaching and learning development grants. Increased rapport with students and SI leaders. Membership in local, national and international SI network. Increased recognition from their colleagues. And increased satisfaction with their teaching role. The institution benefits in several ways. Deployment of a cost-effective, student-centered learning enhancement program. Membership in national and international SI networks and effective means of managing the collective learning power of its students. David, why did you think this was such a noteworthy publication? Well, the things that really stood out for me was the clear articulation of the benefits, not only for the students, whether they be the participants or the uh, students who are serving as the leaders, a very detailed explanation of the benefits for faculty members. I mean, listen back to what Natasha was sharing with us. We just lead a couple of them here. Comprehension level, understanding that, comprehension level of the students, opportunity for faculty members to revisit their previous lectures and perhaps to repeat them again if the comprehension level at the their version of SI or PASS or PAL, uh, they call it different names over in Australia. Faculty members use this as a feedback loop differently than in other countries and particularly inside of the United States. There's more interest by the faculty members to receive the feedback and for them to take action to make sure that students are understanding the fundamental concepts that were explained during the class sessions. And that just really struck me that some of the biggest innovations in teaching, from my observation, are in the United Kingdom, Canada, uh, Europe, Australia. Uh, in some ways, the United States is lagging behind some of these other countries in terms of the responsiveness of faculty members to the needs. I could say more, but I just wanted to hit some of the reasons why I thought this was a particularly notable article and once again, look at the date, 1996. That's nearly a quarter of a century ago. I had the privilege of meeting Mr. Gardner and others within the Australian community doing really great work over there. Matthew is going to be telling us now about the connections that a study group program produces for both the students and the academic department. In 2015, Gates, 
Casas, Servine, and Slattery wrote an article named Using Peer-Led Team Learning to Build University Community College Relationships. It was published in the Conference Proceedings of the Frontiers in Education Conference that occurred in El Paso, Texas, through support from the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. The University of Texas at El Paso and the El Paso Community College began a program to collaborate on adoption of peer-led team learning at El Paso. The effort aims to transfer this effective retention practice in order to establish early connections with female students, create community, and provide activities that improve students' problem-solving skills. The program provides an active learning experience for students and creates leadership roles for undergraduates. For the peer leaders, the experience of working with faculty and guiding their peers through a challenging course is rewarding, and they learn communication, teaching, leadership, and interpersonal skills. Peer leaders become more confident about their career path, and many continue to be involved in the department through undergraduate research positions. This is important for retention and advancement efforts, since the peer leading experience influences the student's motivation to attend graduate school. This paper describes how the partnership was structured, how the practice was transferred, and the challenges that were encountered. It also presents the evaluation results. David, what intrigued you about this publication? Of the many things that are inside of there, I was particularly struck by one of the reasons for supporting the program was the academic department wanted these gifted young people who were running the study review groups to stay inside of that academic department, stay committed to the academic major in their program of study, be so knit into the culture of the academic department that they will end up pursuing their graduate degrees and complete graduate programs. That's the interest of any program, to see students be able to be retained, and also not only generally, but also female students inside of STEM programs, which historically has been a problem if you look at the literature. Women graduate from college more often than men do, but women tend to switch out of the sciences and complete their degrees, some of them, in other academic programs. So it kind of clouds the data about what happens to women inside of college. Well, I think this article helps, gives us some insights. And that's the reason why I thought it was a great one to take a look at. Well, next up is Jennifer, and she's going to highlight an article that focuses on the benefits, once again, for the study group leaders. Gaio. Morris, Boyce, Prem, Demila, and Riceberg wrote the article named The Impacts on Peer Tutors of Learning Group Supplemental Instruction for First Year Engineering Students. The conference proceedings were published in 2020. The purpose of this study was to investigate the impact of peer tutoring experiences on upper class male and female tutors who provided supplemental instruction for first year engineering students enrolled in required general chemistry and physics courses at Northeastern University. Our previous research has shown a correlation between regular use of SI by first year engineering students and increased GPA as well as gender-based differences in SI usage and effects of SI. In this study, we turned our focus to the effects of the tutoring role on the tutors and sought to elucidate whether tutors perceived that they benefited from the SI experience, and if so, in what ways, how gender affected attitudes towards tutoring and the impact of serving as a peer educator, and whether level of commitment to group SI correlated with tutors' perceptions of how they were impacted. 41 individuals who served as peer tutors at Northeastern University between 2005 and 2018 were invited to respond to online surveys. Those who completed the online survey were invited to participate in follow-up phone interviews. Subjects were asked about their experiences with SI, their motivations to provide instruction, their level of commitment to the program, and as they reflected on their college and post-graduation endeavors their perceptions of the value of their tutoring experience. Statistical comparisons were drawn from the responses of 20 female and 9 male tutors to the online survey, and qualitative analysis of transcripts of follow-up phone interviews with 13 women and 4 men were performed. Through the application of grounded theory to transcripts, supported by statistical analysis of data from the online survey, 
it was deduced that increased confidence and preparedness in future endeavors was the core category that linked individuals' tutoring experiences. Participants reported that relationships developed with two Ts, fellow tutors, and faculty mentors during their tutoring experiences impacted them beyond their experiences as tutors. Participants reported improved soft skills, including communication, teamwork, and leadership, and strengthened academic abilities, which resulted from a deeper understanding of the tutored subject matter. Serving as tutors also caused tutors to be more open to receiving tutoring themselves than their coursework. Improvement in soft skills along with enhanced academic ability contributed to an increased sense of confidence and preparedness. Analysis of the role of gender showed that females were more likely than males to perceive an increase in self-confidence and to view themselves as confidence builders for tutees. Women were also more likely than men to become a tutor to improve their communication skills and help others. Years spent as a tutor correlated positively with greater perceived benefits for both genders. This study demonstrates that peer tutoring can have a significant impact on the academic performance and professional development of tutors, particularly females, in addition to tutees. David, what did you notice about this publication? Well, the thing I noticed about this particular study was the focus on gender and how that had an impact on them regarding the program, both from a point of view from the participants as well as the leaders. I mean, one of the findings in here was that females are more likely than males to perceive an increase in self-confidence and to view themselves as confidence builders for the two T's, as they called the participants in the program. It just reminds me that we need to do more research on more of the different demographic groups that participate in these programs, both as the facilitators as well as the participants. Well, we're at the end of part one of this two-part series of looking at the research studies about the impact of the experience for the leaders of the programs and leadership identity and the development of employability skills and things that are related to that. Thank you very much for listening. Please uh, send feedback to me about this particular approach with the synthetic voices doing part of the work and me doing the other part of the work. Feel free to send me an email at arendale at umn, umn dot edu. I'd really appreciate that. So thank you once again, and I hope you join us again for part two. I'm going to go ahead and also post up the PDF of the complete list of all the articles that mention that there was some sort of development of leadership skills in leadership identity. Best wishes, and I hope you tune in for next time.